Hello, and welcome to this Brain Taxi virtual event featuring Honoré Fanon Jeffers. I'm Eric Lorber, the director of Rain Taxi. If you don't yet know about us, we are a nonprofit organization that champions aesthetically adventurous literature. I invite you to check out our website anytime after this event to learn more about our quarterly magazine of critical writing, our annual book festival, which is coming up this fall, our chapbook publishing, and the many events we host throughout the year, among other advocacy programs. Whether you're an occasional visitor or you'd like to become a member, we'd love to have you along for the ride. Tonight's event, like most of Rain Taxi's events, is free to attend. But if you're able to pitch in a little something, feel free to use the donate button at the bottom of your screen. Rain Taxi is privileged to earn funding from stalwart supporters such as the National Endowment for the Arts and the Minnesota State Arts Board but our most vital support actually comes from individual readers like you. There are other ways to participate in tonight's event. Feel free to chime in on the chat. We love to hear your wonderful observations and comments. If you have a question for the author, put that in the ask a question box. I'll be looking at those and gathering them and we'll get to as many as possible at the end of tonight's event. And of course, best of all, you can buy the book by using that button on your screen. Don't forget that when you purchase a book at a literary event, you are supporting not only the author and their publisher, but also the event host and a great independent bookstore based right here in an actual community on planet Earth. Tonight, that's our friends, Majors and Quinn booksellers in Minneapolis. With the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois in my hands. It is my great pleasure to welcome owner Fanon Jeffers. I come to her work, like maybe some of you, through her poetry. Uh, I've been a fan of that for many years. Lucille Clifton said to read it, so you, you, you do what she says, right? Uh, and I've just been uh, staggered over and over uh, most recently by her wonderful book from just about a year and a half ago called The Age of Philip. Uh, if you haven't seen that, I urge you to get on the bandwagon for that book as well. Right now, we'll be talking again about the new novel. And to lead our conversation, we have the wonderful Lisa Jones, longtime friend of our organization and the host here of the great podcast, Black Market Reads as well as other things beaming to you over the airwaves. Uh, thank you both so much for being here and take it away, Lisa. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you, Rain Taxi. Welcome, Honoré. Thank you so much, Lisa. I'm so happy to be here. I am so thrilled to be here. I have so many notes. And so everybody, just let me tell you, when I'm looking down, I'm listening to her intently. I might be taking notes, but I'm also looking at all my notes. I've got them on many different uh, places. So do you mind if we dive right in? Oh, please do. Okay. Let's talk about it. Double consciousness. How would you explain double consciousness to someone who's not familiar with W.E.B. Du Bois or the concept? Well, what Dr. Du Bois talked about in um, his uh, double consciousness theory is that African Americans are never able to just think about themselves and how they are view themselves. They are always conscious of the white gaze in America. Um, and, I, you know, I used to think that he was exaggerating about that until I went to Senegal. And um, I went to Senegal to do research on um, uh, Phyllis Wheatley Peters uh, the 18th century African-American poet. But just just to sort of be in the place and walk among the people and all of that. And I noticed that for the first time in my life, I wasn't afraid of running into white people. Um, even though I grew up in the Deep South and I spent time in uh, all Black settings, there was still outside of that, you know, a, a white community. And um, in the Deep South, you know, you just never knew when, you know, something was going to jump off. But in Senegal, I didn't have to worry about that. Everybody was Black. 
the police were black. Um, you know, the, the president of the country was black. And I mean, I very, you know, I think I saw one or two French people the entire time I was there, but they were in a black space. So I noticed that even the way that they carried themselves, they didn't have, you know, this sort of, you know, I own this or whatever kind of, and that's not to say, cause I have very dear white friends. That's not to say that all white people are bad or whatever. I have very beloved, you know, um, uh, white people in my life. But so that is double consciousness. Double consciousness is you are always aware of white people in America when you were black. You can't ever let, you can't ever just be yourself. That is the, I think, the, the most simple definition of double consciousness. I really appreciate that because it's so foundational to your work. I want to make sure that people understand where you and Dr. Du Bois were coming from because thinking about this idea of double consciousness, where do you remember your first experience at having to be doubly conscious? Um, I think it was the first time I went into white spaces. Um, what I would like to say is with, with Ailey in the book, he only has double consciousness again when she enters white spaces. Um, and so there's always this sort of moment where you see the intrusion of her having to be aware of white people, but she does, but when she's in all black spaces, it just never appears, even though she even has a white aunt. The white aunt sets aside her white privilege and enters this black family, which makes her extraordinary. At first, she's Aunt Diane. She's not, you know, too savvy. And Ailey's mother, Belle, gets her, you know, gets her, you know, gathers her. Um, but yes, I would say it was junior high school. No, it was sixth grade when I left Fayetteville Street Elementary School in Durham, North Carolina, which was 99% black. There was one, one, one white girl in the whole school, Kelly. And then there was a um, Puerto Rican girl who considered herself white, and that was Bernadette in the entire school. And so we just, you know, we ignored them. It was our space. And and it and it and it was a formerly uh, segregated school. That was the first time that I went to a white junior high school, and it was um, the first time that I left that place. I went to uh, um, St. Francis of Assisi Catholic School in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. It was horrible. They were they were vicious little children. Um, sometimes casually vicious, sometimes. Um, and the nuns were vicious. They were white. And then I went to junior high school, Guy B. Phillips um, uh, Junior High School, and that was bad. It was assumed, I, I will never forget that all the little black girls in the seventh grade were put into a um, sex education class to tell us um, not to get venereal disease, uh, um, uh, sexually transmitted disease. We were 12. The adultification of black girls that continues. The adultification, we were adultified. And my mother did not know that, the, you know, I wanted to be around the black girls. So I didn't, I knew there was something wrong with it. I didn't tell her. Um, you know, it's strange, Lisa. This is the first time I've thought about this in years. So I didn't tell her because, you know, the little girls and I, I mean, I was real socially awkward, so I wanted friends. And then I think it was maybe March into the year, and my month was like, absolutely not. And she pulled me out of there. She was like, how dare they? And that was, yeah, that, that was, you know, I've never even, you know, I, I think I've let it, I think I've, I pushed it to, to the side because I, you know, j just 
and all the teachers, and they were white female teachers, of course, all even the science teacher, all of them knew, you know, and it and it never even occurred to them that there was something wrong with that. And then I had a science teacher. She must be dead now. You can't defame the dead. So her name was Miss Ratliff. Legally, you cannot defame the dead. And I remember one day, um, and I loved Miss Ratliff. I loved her dearly. She had a ponytail that she she had a little clip in it. And when she would nod in science class, her ponytail would bounce up and down. And I just loved her so much. And one day, Miss Ratliff asked to see me after class. And um, and and I was scared because I was like, did I do something wrong? You know, so and she had this real sort of quiet, sweet voice, you know. So she began to tell me that she was deeply concerned for me because I was loud. And women were not allowed to be loud. And she was deeply, deeply concerned because if I did not learn how to have a quiet voice, no one would ever love me. And I would never get married and I would never have children. And although I was very hurt by that, I realized that what was happening was um, I didn't have the vocabulary to um, think about what, you know, to, I mean, to, to sort of name it critically, right? But I've always been a critical thinker, even when I, you know, was too young to have that sort of vocabulary. And I realized that there was something about me that bothered Miss Ratliff, and she was trying to damage me. At a very, there was something about my my self confidence, uh, even though I didn't view myself as self confident. But she, there was something a power that Miss Ratliff saw, and here I was, a little socially awkward girl, and this woman in her early fifties. I remember because it was like a gray sort of salt and pepper was trying to wound this little girl. And that was when I believe I became a feminist. Mm -hmm. She blessed me. Even mm -hmm. though it was ugly, she blessed me because I knew that Miss Ratliff was being mean to me and that there was something that about me that that made her feel less than this little girl made this grown, you know, grown woman who was old enough to be this child's grandma. And I remember I kept that in my head for years. You know, that's double consciousness. That's when double consciousness is a verb. Black women that's are when loud. Double consciousness is a verb that is a brilliant observation, Sister Lisa. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sis. I really appreciate that. You know, when I first started reading the, the your novel, I was thinking that racism and white supremacy were the original sin, but you said it was greed. Mm -hmm. I said it was greed because I think that we as Black people, um, and certainly we, we have more than a right to claim our suffering, okay? But I think sometimes what white supremacy does is it divides BIPOC people so that we only feel like, you know, we've got to elbow other people out of the way, right? So that our pain is front and center instead of, you know, joining together and Understanding that, you know, if we join together, you know, we could we we could really be powerful. And so when the whole thing about, you know, when I named it as greed, is that I remember um President Obama, who of course I love. Um, I mean, I'm 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 black and I'm from the South, you know how that happened. You know, even when he did stuff I didn't like, I was like, well, you know, I got to stay strong with that brother, you know. So, uh, but when he, I think it was President Obama who said slavery was 
the nation's original sin. It may have been someone else. So I'm uh, and and knowing what I know about events, if I'm wrong, somebody gonna say so. You know, <laughs> they gonna let me know. Right? Yeah, they fact check quick. <laughs> right, they're gonna do that. They're gonna Google that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but um, um, and I remember two things when as much as I loved President Obama and he had, you know, I truly believe he he has some kind of hoodoo power because I remember when um, nobody thought that he could win against Hillary Clinton. And then he did that. Yes, we can speech. And then the young folks put it to music and that was a wrap. But I remember he would talk about we settled the frontier and every time I would hear him say that, it would go all through me because there were people living there. That wasn't no frontier. You know, that's like somebody coming in my house and be like, oh, look at this. Look at this empty house with all of this furniture. And I'm standing in the corner shouting, this is my house. This is my house. And and people were like. And there's no one here, you know, and that, you know, that's right. And so I began to think about, um, there were other moments. Um, I remember, you know, I'm older, um, when Chris Rock had this, this comedy special and he said, you know, they got rid of the Native Americans or something like that. You, you never just go into the Red Lobster and see a family of Native Americans kicking it. And I thought, clearly this brother ain't been out to um to Oklahoma or to other places in this area because I saw Native American families kicking it all the time. So I began to understand that by not speaking about the removal of the five Southeastern tribes, what was happening was an erasure of their history and possibly my own history, you know, in my family, we talk about Native American ancestry on both sides, but I'm very careful about that because I don't want to intrude or to, you know, I can't prove it because you can't prove that you were part of one of the five uh, uh, Southeastern tribes unless your people were removed. Mm -hmm. And so if your people stayed, which the, the history is that my that um, my ancestor passed as biracial and married a black man. So when I began to think about this, I thought, well, if slavery is not the original sin, then what was? And then I began to think about what informed human trafficking, wow. you know, the transatlantic slave trade. And that was greed. What informed the removal of the, of the Southeastern tribes? That was greed because they had to get rid of them for the federal road, but also for long, for short staple cotton. And so, you know, that that's how I arrived at that philosophy. Oh, the stereotyping that results in the myth of manifest destiny. The land is given to white people because they're white it. and they are in charge of the land, regardless of who is already here. They have a right to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have a right to it. Just mm -hmm. like, you know, you know, they say, well, you know, um, black people weren't Christian. They were pagans. And so therefore, you know, we as, you know, we Europeans, white Europeans as Christians, um, you know, we, 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 we're helping them, mm. you know, to 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 find Jesus, not you know, and ignorant people don't understand. Um, uh, although you know there are er there were areas in West Africa that were not uh, uh, Muslim, but for those areas that were Muslim, such as the Senegambia region, um, you know, those people who have done even just a little bit of study um, on on Islam would know that Jesus is in the Holy Quran. He is not the savior, but he is in the Holy Quran. And so, you know, that's, I mean, but you know, most people's religion is my, my God can beat up your God. Mm -hmm. 
you know, my 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 this is the this is the religious Olympics, and we're gonna duke it out and take it to the mattresses. You know, <laughs> you know it's the truth. I mean, in this mm -hmm. you're right. Let's talk about faith because faith right. is central in your writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk about it because you talk about it in your forward, you talk about it, you know, at the end mm -hmm. of your in your acknowledgments, you give honor to him first. So talk about That's it. Yeah. I always say, first as always, I give unashamed glory and praise. Now, that does not mean that I look down on people who do not believe in God. Several of my friends do not believe in God. Um, and I'm a weird kind of Christian. First of all, I'm a radical uh, feminist and I'm pro-LGBTQ. And I always laugh that... Um, you know, that's the oxymoron like jumbo shrimp, you know, <laughs> you know, but that's, that's, how I feel. Right, that's how I feel about the thing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> God makes no mistakes. And um, everyone is made in, in his, her, their image. OK, but um, but what I will say is that for me, Honoré Fanon Jeffers and for many African Americans. You know, my Angelou used to joke that there were only two black atheists in the world. Okay. And you were hard pressed to find many African Americans who do not have some kind of faith. Okay. I think that is because it is a rock that we have leaned upon in very difficult times. Um, so it's not just that I'm a faithful person. I was trying to adhere to historical realities. There were many Black people, the first Black people who traveled over the water that did not have traditional West African views, but sometimes there were traditional West African views combined with Islam. But the first were, were, were Muslims. And so that's one of the reasons that um, I depict Islam in in the early, you know, some of the early songs, because that is historically accurate. Right. Um, and, you know, and I've, I've done research on that. Right. For example, Sylvian Juice, uh, Servants of Allah. So um, faith is very important, but also ancestral tending. Hmm. Um, for me, as a visioning woman, who is the child of a visioning woman, who was mentored by the great Lucille Clifton, a visioning woman, I know that um, we talk to the ancestors. That sounds weird a lot to a lot of people. However, what I have also noticed is that to my Native American friends and colleagues, being a visioning person, um, having connections, having conversations with ancestors is not viewed as weird. Um, that is viewed as a regular thing that you do. And so, um, yes, faith is very important, um, you know, to, to quote from James Weldon Johnson's Lift Every Voice and Sing, which started as a poem. OK, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears. Right. So, you know, I want people to understand not just the reality for these characters, but for the reality of um, black people in the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries, you know, but also to understand some of the issues that arise in uh, faithful Black communities, homophobia, um, you know, those, those sort of things, right? Patriarchy, um, you know, uh, no, there are no un, unflawed situations in the book, even with the best folk, even with the nicest folk, everybody's flawed. Because every human being is flawed. I'm flawed. 
I thought that was part of the beauty of the book is that nobody was hailed as perfect or close to perfect. I mean, right. everybody right. had a thing and you know, in humanity, everybody has a thing. You know, I wanna go back to loud and okay. silence and secrets. Okay. The secrets we're forced to keep in order to keep our family safe. The secrets we're forced to keep in order for our mamas not to be hurt further, but they could be our sister's secrets too. Mm -hmm. Secrets mm -hmm. are all through the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They work in myriad ways. Would you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I think that um, one of the things, you know, and, I, and, and as I've been saying this same thing, I want people to understand when I mentioned Toni Morrison, I'm not trying to compare myself to the great Toni Morrison. She was a genius and we were blessed to be walking the same earth as her at the same time. So even though other people have very generously and kindly compared me to Toni Morrison, I do not. There, There is but one. Okay. Um, but Toni Morrison used to talk about when she would start a novel, there was a question that she, you know, or a series of questions that she always wanted to ask, right? So the question that I wanted to know, how do we get to this place? How do we get to this place as a country? How do we get to this place as a Southern region? How do we get to this place as a black community? How do we get to this place as a family? And so one of the things when you're looking at African-American communities, Many times people who have been transgressed against are shunted to the side because there is a, um, it's an ill-informed impulse. But the impulse is we have lost so much. We can't lose anyone else. Everybody, and in particular, because there has been a fetishizing of patriarchy in black communities. If a transgressor is male, then definitely we cannot afford to lose him. That's the attitude. And so what happens is the least of um, uh, victims, uh, survivors, if they survive, children, and um, women, um, uh, trans women, cisgender women, and binary, non-binary individuals, those people are considered, I don't consider them, I'm just saying this is my observation over the years, right? Um, uh, homosexual folks, you know, my LGBTQ kin, those are those folks are considered to be the quote unquote least. And so the heterosexual cisgender male or the one who pretends to be, okay, is considered to be the best. And so when he transgresses, we must not only forgive him, we must pretend it didn't even happen in the first place, okay? We must pretend it didn't even happen in the first place. So what happens, Sister Alyssa, is that um, we mimic the same sort of erasure of history in our communities that white supremacists impose on, on Black people and other BIPOC people, right? None of that happened to you, or it wasn't so bad, walk it off you know, just get past it, you know. And so this is how secrets there are. And again, because this is a book about America writ large, there are national secrets, okay? Um, you know, we, we have a, a, a discussion about how this nation began and it always is about this glorious rhetoric, right? You know, when people say, well, that's in the past. Well, this is what I'm saying whenever these sort of things happen. There's always a lack of logic. Everything in American history happened in the past, the good and the bad. OK, so, yeah, it's in the past. The Declaration of Independence is in the past. The American Revolution is in the past. OK, but I don't see you saying let's 
let's push that to the side. It's only when people who are considered less than, right, are saying, I was here too, but not only here too, I built this country. Okay, well, we, well, we don't, many of us, a, a few of us know that over 5,000 black men fought on the on the continental side, you know, on the revolutionary side of the American Revolution. Fewer of us know that 40 to 50,000 fought on the side of the British, but not a lot of us know that Native Americans fought in the American Revolution. They have fought in every war, okay? So there's this attitude, those are the secrets. We push what we don't want to hear about under a national rock. And in the same way, there's a lot of mirroring or a lot of metaphors happening. In the same way, we push family secrets. That's in the past. We'll pull out the real cute, the you know, the, the pictures of people in their Easter clothes and, you know, in the and the James Van Der Zee, you know, f photographs and the daguerreotypes and all of that. But we do not want to talk about how someone in our family suffered intimate abuse. We don't, we don't want to hear that. No. We don't want to hear that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, you crazy. Oh, we're going to say, you don't love black people. We're going to say whatever needs to be said to shut you up because we are not interested in this. And so what happens in the novel is that these, these three little girls, Ailey and her two sisters, who are transgressed against, who suffer intimate abuse at the hands of their grandfather, a um, couple of people have thought that Gandhi is white. Gandhi is not white. There are people, you're like, who thought Gandhi was white? <laughs> well, sorry, my face betrays me. Sister, sister, listen, you know, we know that there are, um, you know, enclaves in black communities where you can go back generations and you can't find one brown, you know, brown skinned person, right? But I don't think a lot of white people are aware of that. They, and that's why I wrote this book. There are a lot of, there's a curtain that's pulled back, right? As as I quote from du, Dr. Du Bois's Talented Tenth in right around maybe the end of the first third of the book, you misjudge us because you do not know us. You don't know us, but you're going to learn today. Okay. You're going to recognize learn today. Okay. <laughs> So, um, Gandhi, this incredibly um, urbane, handsome, in his own way, you know. Um, I mean, that that's not my preferred, you know, man, right? But in his own way, handsome, urbane, well-dressed, well-educated, Black bourgeoisie, you know, doctor. That is molesting children. But Ailey's mother can't even wrap her mind, wouldn't even know where to begin, you know, and she never finds out. And I think some people might be a little upset about that, you know, that there's never a reconciliation with that, right? Um, she never finds out, but that you have this, this, um, this doctor that would do that. And he says to the children, and I'm going to be very, you know, careful here. I can do anything. I'm a doctor. Who's going to believe you? He knows his power. He knows his power. And that is the same way when we move through, you know, there's some really good men in the book, Uncle Root, right? Mm -hmm. But there are other men where they're like, uh, who going to check me, boo? I'm I, I'm a man. Okay? I am a heterosexual cisgender man, and, and you are not going to check me. I run this thing. Okay? And that is, that is what I wanted people to see. That, you know, we fetishize patriarchy in this community. You know, there are a lot of black men where they want to have that same power 
that white men have. They don't understand that is a twisted, ugly power. If we ever had any mistake about that, any misconception, January the 6th, when we saw those kind of men break into that Capitol building, we should know we need to get as far away from that right there as possible. That is a destructive force, right? Um, but we do. We fetishize in Black communities and to get back to the faith. You know, you'll hear the traditional Black people, the Bible say, well, the Bible also has slavery. You know, it's, it's, it's conveniently hidden by using servants. <laughs> that means slaves. That means slaves, right? They weren't paying none of them people a, a, a wage, right? Um, there was intimate abuse and justification of intimate abuse in the Bible. There is, um, you know, all sorts of racism in the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not stumping on people's faith because my faith is rock hard. But what I'm doing is looking at the Bible as literature, right. not right, you know. And so there's all of that. So, but they'll they'll bring it up in a minute. But they're picking and choosing. That's it. You can't cherry pick. You have to take the whole. Yeah, you have to take the thing. whole thing as a whole. And when you take the whole thing as a whole, then you know you decide how you feel. I'm not going to tell people how they should feel. I love this little thing, but it just be slipping off. But you know what? It's gorgeous. So keep doing you. I do it's love it. Cool. I do love it. I got it on it. <laughs> Each time you adjust it, it makes me take a deep breath and interrogate what I want to know next. Oh, I love you, sister. Thank you. <laughs> I adore you too. I'm telling you. Well, okay. Our time is so short, but I want to ask at least two more things before okay, we let me go try to audience more questions. Okay. okay, next. You write, white men pass their misery on to the Africans. And sister, that landed with me so deeply, so mm. mm. And I thought mm. to myself, why do white people have a need to constantly rename things? Why do they have a need to constantly <laughs> rename black people? Black people. Well, I will say that when you rename something, you erase documentation. Right? You erase documentation. I mean, I use Native American, but, um, you know, after talking to some of my colleagues and friends, because, you know, I don't want anybody to... Um, to, to get things wrong with black folks or whatever. So I'm real careful and I ask people and I'll say, I, I hope this isn't a stupid question or whatever. Cause I don't wanna be that person that people have made me, you know, this representative of all, right? But it's not Native American, it's it's Greek, it's Choctaw. It's, it's Seminole, it's Narragansett and, and on and on and on, right? But there's this, this when you erase it, then you make it harder for people to go back and find the proof that you did what you did. Okay. You know, you, you, you somebody come over with one name, you're going to rename them something else. That way, you know, when, when they're trying to figure out if you've sold away their children or their parents or whatever, how are they going to find that out? And how are they going to prove what you did to them? This is why there's this whole thing. I can understand white people saying they tired of slavery. I cannot understand black people being so damned stupid. I'm sorry to say they don't want to hear about slavery. And illogical. They don't want to hear about slavery, but they want a reparations check. What kind of sense does that make? Nonsense. Um, I mean, you, you, we're going to have to get around the kitchen table, sis. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's how I, that's how I feel about that. I could go on and on, but then you have a second question that you well, want. Thank you to. for being so gracious. Okay. I don't want to miss the humanity of black people. You know, I think that's what's missed in us all the time. The dehumanizing of black folk. You show black love, black complexity, black humanity all over you intended to do that. I can see you smiling. Yes, I did. I, I, in the midst of sorrow. Yes. Because that's what Dr. Du Bois did. In the midst of sorrow. And I think that's the thing when, 
you know, our our young folk and 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 some and some older folks say they're tired of hearing about slavery. Number one, we have again fetishized imperialism. Okay, going and taking, you know, as in Saki Shange talked about somebody almost walked off with all of my stuff. Okay, taking somebody's stuff from them. Okay, we fetishize that, that that's what we should be looking toward. Right. Um, But the humanity of this was the other thing. There's a lot of trauma in this book. Real talk. I am not going to lie to people. But what I want people to understand is that I do, I would not lead you astray and have you travel through all of this without coming out on the other side. As my people, our people, Sister Lissa, have done, okay? And it is our humanity that has allowed us. Are we an unflawed people? Absolutely not. And there are many cultural workers who are working with us to get us through to that other side. Sister Tarana Burke, you know, Me Too movement, right? Talking about um, intimate assault. I always say intimate because it kind of, you know, I don't want to thump anybody or trigger anybody, right? Within Black communities, outside of Black communities, she's doing that work. There are other, you know, wonderful cultural workers who were doing that, right? Cultural workers, you know, who are talking about, um, um, you know, uh, violence against LGBTQ individuals within Black communities, right? So are we an unflawed uh, people? No. But we at the heart of it, right? And I could, you know, if I had more time, go off on the fact that there have always been LGBTQ individuals in African communities and people who go against that binary always that has been, right? Um, You can't be listening to to the Pookie Hoteps saying, you know, in Africa, you like, okay. (laughs) Have never been. Right, you need to get up off of them websites <laughs> and go and read you some books. Okay. Okay. He is not a thing. Go to the library. It's free for all of us. Okay. But um, but yes, so the humanity of our people, that is what has allowed us to experience these spiritual and physical assaults, right? And to be here. And to not go anywhere. We ain't going nowhere. This is who we are. And you cannot stop us. Okay. And in particular with black women, you cannot stop us. We tend this culture. Right. And so that is what I want. I always make a promise to someone reading a book. You're going to travel through some dark places, but you're going to come out on the other side and it's going to be all right. But ain't going to be no weddings because I'm not Steve Harvey. Okay, (laughs) so you 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 can just set that aside. This is not about whether Ailey get a man or not. Okay, so let let that particular hope go. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) what this book is about. Wise counsel. It's about so much more. You know, when I was reading, I thought about Lucille Clifton. I thought about her poem, Memories. They want me to remember, but they want me to remember their memories, but I keep on remembering. I keep on remembering mine. (laughs) Why people be mad at me sometimes. There you go. (laughs) There you go. Don't be mad at us, Black people. We have to remember so we can survive, right? Yeah. Yeah. What do you want them to know, Sister Honoré, before I have to turn it back over? I have just under a minute. What do you want to leave the people with? This, this book is a love letter to Black women. It's a love letter. That's why love is in the title. But it's also a love letter to this nation. As flawed and as hurtful as this nation has been, this is not someone else's nation, this is ours. And this is our time. My sister, Honoré Fanon Jeffers, thank you for your novel. Thank you for tending to my garden. Just as you indicated in the foreword, you are gonna tend to so many more. This has been my privilege, thank you. 
Thank you, sister. I appreciate you. Thank you. It's now my privilege to bring back Eric Lorber with Rain Taxi, who will share some questions from the audience. Thank you for this transformative experience, Honoré, and thank you, Eric. Oh, thank you both so much for this deep dive into the deep end. Uh, uh, people are uh, so grateful for, for this. And before I come to our questions, there are several. I want to remind everyone that they can purchase the book directly. It is now out. Uh, it's getting uh, rave reviews, uh, as, as we all knew it would. And uh, if you purchase the book from us tonight, I forgot to mention earlier, but our friends at the bookstore will include a specially designed book plate that Honoré has been so gracious to sign. So you'll be getting a signed copy of this new American classic. And uh, boy, who wouldn't want that? Uh, Honoré, our first question uh, is in fact, uh, maybe about the book as the object because they're wondering, I, I, did, I might not have said it, but it's 816 pages long. It is a, 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 a truly epic novel. Uh, how long did it take to write? And what's the connection between writing a book like this and all the poetry writing that you've done? Uh, specifically, maybe The Age of Phyllis, because that also had uh, a, an epic sweep to it. Well, um, I'm always working on two projects at the same time, sometimes three. The reason I do that, and I don't want anybody to be impressed by that. <laughs> the reason I do that is because if I get stuck on um, um, one of the projects, I can pivot, okay? Because if I can't pivot, I, I can get real bereft. And, you know, and, 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 it, and it's, it just doesn't feel good. So um, first to answer the, the one of the uh, halves of the question, right? Um, I was uh, working on this book at the same time that I was deep in the middle of the age of Phyllis. I began looking at the age of Phyllis as a book instead of simply four or five poems in a particular, um, uh, or actually eight poems. I was going to do eight poems based on one line from on being brought from Africa to America. And then what happened is I, it, when I began to, when I encountered that information about her husband, Phyllis Wheatley Peters, husband, I call her Phyllis Wheatley Peters because she claimed her name is Phyllis Peters. And I think it's racist and rude to continue to call her, uh, you know, Phyllis Wheatley after she got married. So what happened was when um, that was 2009, when I went to the American Antiquarian Society um, to do research, I'm now an elected member um, of the American Antiquarian Society. Um, I was trying to figure out how to write a novel because I had promised my agent, my literary agent, Sarah Burns, that I would write her novel. Um, and I had been lying to her that I would write her novel because I didn't want to uh, write a novel. I only wanted to write short stories. But I love Sarah, so I wanted to keep her. And so I had promised her that. So I began... Um, writing poems for the age of Phyllis in 2003 or 2004. That's also when my research happened. Now, the age of Phyllis takes place in, you know, Africa, the transatlantic slave trade, you know, Middle Passage, there's a section on the Middle Passage. And then what we now know is New England, okay? So I couldn't use any of the New England research for, for Georgia, right? But when I knew that the book was going to be about Georgia, um, I began doing research and I began to notice a coalescing of racial attitudes regardless of where the locale was, right? These colonial racial attitudes against Africans 
and Native Americans. That's how a lot of the research happened. In terms of the difference between poetry and fiction, I had always written fiction, but I had to figure, that's a whole long story. I had to figure out how to learn how to write. It took me a good three years, four years, right? But it took me nine years to write the book that was sold by my agent, um, Sarah Burns, to Harper Books. And then it took me another two and a half years to edit it. Um, but when you see the songs, you see a spiritual guide through the book. Poetry is very much like prayer for me. And many times I dream poems. The songs came to me in dreams. I initially, I had no intention of writing this serious book. It was supposed to be a beach read. And people, people laugh and they think I'm, you know, falsely modest. No, that was my intention. A beach read to placate my agent because I loved her and I wanted to keep her so that I could write my short stories, right? But then I began having dreams and that's when I knew that the, that the book was, was going to be more expansive. What an incredible backstory. Uh, wow. Uh, well, our, our next question is. You're like, whoa, okay. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm, I'm just, uh, it's like being in a, in this gorgeous labyrinth. Thank you. Uh, Someone wants to know about, and th this is really actually a great question building off what you just said about working with fiction as compared to poetry. Uh, how did you uh, think about how you were going to treat African-American language throughout the history of the book in terms of dialect, African-American English, so forth, and the needs of the fiction, you know, in, in such a, uh, an epic sweep? How did you approach that? Well, you know, I, I think many African-Americans code switch. We go back and forth between the traditional vernacular, that's what we call it, um, keeping in mind that the root of vernacular is verna, which is Latin for a slave born in his master's house. OK, so um, so the thing about it is that um, I speak in the vernacular all the time. It used to be that I would be um, kind of embarrassed to sort of shift back and forth. Now that I'm an older person, I'm 54, and I have a confidence about who I am, and I know that I'm smart. It doesn't matter if people feel like this is not the face of intelligence or, you know, this corn pone and molasses accent of mine is not, you know, what a smart person is supposed to. I had to come to that, though. Right. So um, I have an ear. Some other people have gifts I don't have. OK. And a lot of times people feel like, oh, you're just being modest. No, I think I'm a good nudging up against very good fiction writer. I am not a great fiction writer yet. I, I, I think maybe in 10 more years I'll be a great I'm, I'm telling truth, Sister Liz. I'll be a great fiction writer. Now, poetry, can't nobody mess with me. I'm a master poet. But I have been doing that thing for a real long time, right? So in terms of fiction, it is a natural voice to me, the vernacular, the, the African-American vernacular, because I have a poet's ear. Um, but I also grew up in the deep south. Everybody can't do it. I've seen some people and it's it's a little sad when they try to move into, right? Because people think all black people can do language and all black people, everybody can't do everything. You know, I, I you know, there's certain things I just can't do, right? So the language is natural to me, all right? Because it was my mama's language. But also, I notice class differences. There's also a difference between vernacular that was spoken by Black people born in 1900, 1909, and Black people born in the 60s or the 70s. There's a difference between those Black people 
and the kids that are talking now. And I know the difference between that. I, I mean, when you spend a lot of time by yourself and you spend a lot of time in your own head, you figure, you know, you figure those things out. I'm not trying to diminish my talents. I do think I have something extraordinary. But but by the same token, I think we all have something extraordinary. The problem is that some people try to make what they don't have as extraordinary the thing that they work on. Right. I, I got about half of an octave. I'm not going to be trying to get up on stage acting like I'm Jill Scott or somebody like that. You got to know, you know, what you're working with. And this is what I'm working with. But other people, everybody has something extraordinary. So, Right. Beautiful. And this final question is going to take us full circle back to where you and Lissa started the conversation uh, talking about double consciousness. Okay. And uh, they want to know they're a, they're a fellow reader like me of your poetry uh, and want to know if there's a connection between that double consciousness and the double bind of what you called in your collection, the glory gets the Southern anthropological equation of lady plus race. Is there a connection there? Lady, L-A-D-Y. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, I got to tell you, I mean, that's a long conversation. I'm going to try to be succinct. It's definitely difficult to be a Black Southern woman and be a pro-sex feminist, right? You're always worried about, even at this age where, you know, nobody's going to think a woman in, in her 50s is a virgin. I mean, it's good if she is, you know. Hey, we all got our thing, right? But you do, you worry, am I a good girl? Do people think I'm a nice lady? You know, do I? And, and, and I've always been somebody who was resistant against that. But then I always wanted men to think I was a lady. And so you move back and forth and it's very difficult. And it is, a, it's a box and it's, it's, it's a box where you can't breathe sometimes. The way, and I'm realizing this just now, the way that I negotiate that is that I am my full self, you know? Um, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a little bit raunchier than I show here, but I'm my full self, but I have a kindness and a graciousness when I'm dealing with people that allows me to inhabit one part of being ladylike, but also being my full self allows me to inhabit myself, you know, the full identity of being a black feminist, right? A womanist, which a womanist is a black feminist that was identified by Alice Walker in In Search of Our Mother's Garden. So that's how I do that. I have a very uh, elaborate manners that I that I have when I meet people, I do not assume familiarity. I, I use old fashioned language and you will see that happening in the book. Notice that Ailey never calls an elder by their first name. It's always Miss, Mr, you know, whatever. That is how I was reared, right? My mother is a very gracious individual, right? So that's how I am able to negotiate the claustrophobia of, of having this patriarchal morality, this, this what, what uh, Higginbotham calls the politics of respectability, right? The way that I, which is specifically a black woman's um, theory, the way that I negotiate that, but I'm still my full self, is that I that I I bring this graciousness, you know, forward. Well, I'll I'll say uh, thank you so much. We are so privileged to help launch the love songs of W. E. B. Du Bois into the world. Uh, Lissa, thank you for your stellar contribution as always to our audience listening. Uh, thank you for being there. Spread the word uh, and. Uh, 
to all, good night. Thank you.